our quarter has really sped along. We're already on lesson 11, just two more lessons after this one this week for our three Cosmic Messages series. The title of our lesson this week is The Seal of God and the Mark of the Beast. We've been studying the central issues in the great controversy between good and evil and focused on the fact that the central issue is worship. Lucifer, a created being, disobeyed his creator. He wanted to rule. He wanted to sit upon the throne. He wanted to be exalted above the creator. And the issues in the great controversy have to do with loyalty. They have to do with authority. They have to do with the law of God and worship. Here in the introduction to this week's lesson, I've written this paragraph that I think is really significant as it leads us into the lesson this week. In contrast to the pressure, the, the economic boycott, the force, the coercion that Satan brings upon those whom he tries to coerce to worship him, in contrast to that, love is the great motivating force of the kingdom of God. Rather than worshiping the beast, God's people find their greatest joy and highest delight in worshiping him. They're committed to him because they know how committed he is to them. There's only one thing that will keep any of us from receiving the mark of the beast in the end time, a love for Jesus so deep that nothing can break our hold upon him. And I want to emphasize that we're going to get into some very deep study on the mark of the beast. But the only thing that can keep any of us from being deceived, because the deceptions in the last days are going to be so incredibly powerful, is a love for Jesus that is so deep, a love for Jesus that is so committed, that the only thing that will keep us is that strong faith of Jesus that he places within our heart in response to our love for him. In Revelation 14, verse 12, this war comes to a focal point. And John on the island of Patmos writes about God's end time people. And he talks about two characteristics that they have. Uh, John, Revelation 14, 12 says, here is the patience of the saints. Another word for patience is endurance. Another word for saints or believers. Here is the endurance of the believers. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So here are people who keep God's commandments and the faith of Jesus. I wonder what that means. The Greek word for patience, you know, it says here is the patience of the saints, and the New Testament is written in Greek, of course, is hupomoni, which is better translated steadfast endurance. So we can say here is the steadfast endurance. These people hang on. These people do not give up. These people do not compromise their, in, their integrity in the word of God. It says, I've written, God will have an end time people who are loyal to him in the face of opposition and fierce persecution. Through his grace, they stand with steadfast endurance, living God-centered, grace-filled, obedient lives. But notice it says the faith of Jesus. What is the faith of Jesus? You remember when Jesus died on the cross, and I've put this under Monday's lesson, the cosmic struggle, that Jesus hung there, and Matthew 27 says that Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why would Jesus ever make that appeal? Why would Jesus ever cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Didn't he say, destroy this body in three days, I'll raise it up again? He did. But when he entered into the cross, the guilt of humanity weighing upon him was so great. You know, in Galatians 3, verse 13, it says, cursed is everyone that hangs upon the tree. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, it says, he who knew no sin became sin for us. So Christ took upon himself the guilt, the shame, the condemnation of the entire human race. And when he did, the guilt of sin was so great, not his sin, because he lived a perfect righteous life. There was no spot or blemish in him. But he took upon himself our sin, our guilt, our shame, our condemnation. 
He was treated as we deserve, so we could be treated as he deserves. He took upon himself the guilt of our sins, so we could take upon ourselves his righteousness. He was clothed with the garments of shame and condemnation, so we could be clothed with the garments of righteousness. And when Jesus took all that upon himself, it wasn't the nails through the hand, his hands that killed him. It wasn't the crown of thorns upon his head that killed him. It was the guilt and shame of the sins of the human race. And so as Christ hung there, he, he experienced the hiding of the Father's face. He could not see through the portals of the tomb, as Ellen White says. And so he was dying the death that the sinner would die, the second death. What is the second death? It is this sense of, of the guilt of sin is so great. It's the sense of abandonment. It's the sense of aloneness on that cross. It's the sense that, 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 that you can go into the grave and never come out and that you're gone and lost forever. That's what Jesus bore on the cross for us. And marvel of all marvels, love of all loves. There's no way you can explain it. It's not comprehensible. But Christ was willing to suffer eternal loss if necessary for you and for me. Now, thank God the sacrifice was accepted. Thank God Christ rose from the dead. And thank God he lives in heaven as our great high priest today. But wait, what is the faith of Jesus? It's a faith that trusts when it cannot see. It's a faith that believes when all around it are circumstances screaming at it not to believe. What is the faith of Jesus? It is the quality of Christ's faith as he hung upon the cross because his final words were, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Jesus died in hope. Jesus died in faith. Jesus died in confidence in the Father's love. Jesus did not die filled with despair and hopelessness. That's why he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. So the faith of Christ is the quality of Jesus' faith imparted to us as a gift by Christ that we exercise that will take us through the dark days ahead. It is the faith of Jesus that will take us through the coming economic boycott. It is the faith of Jesus that will take us through imprisonment and torture. It is the faith of Jesus that will take us through it will take us through the death decree that hangs over our heads. Now, what are the issues in this final mark of the beast that are coming up? There has been an ungodly chain down through the centuries, and the mark of the beast prophecy in Revelation 13 tells us about the worst, the absolute fever pitch of Satan's war against God. In Revelation 13, verse 15 to 17, I read, he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or in their foreheads, that no one might buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of his beast or the number of his name. So here you have very clearly outlined the fever pitch that Satan works with, an economic boycott, and then where one can't buy or sell, and ultimately a death decree. We find this crisis coming. Does this crisis need to fill us with fear? Certainly not fear. Solemnity, yes. Deeper commitment and dedication, certainly. But there will be those who will never yield to the oppressive powers of Satan. They follow the lamb wherever he goes. Now, how can we identify this beast power? Revelation chapter 13 gives us identifying marks, a number of identifying marks for the beast power. Let's just look at two in this lesson. Uh, the first is Revelation 13 verse 1, I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a great beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now, the beast which I saw was like a leopard, the feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his seat, and great authority. Now, the first thing we notice is that this beast is a composite beast. He has the features of a lion, a bear, a leopard, and a dragon. Um, that reminds us of Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. So this power must follow the Roman Empire. 
In fact, it says the dragon, or pagan Rome, gives it its seat and great authority. Now, I thought, though, the dragon represented Satan. You won't want to miss the note in Wednesday's lesson. It says, from the Ad Seventh Avenue Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 817, though primarily representing Satan, the dragon, in a secondary sense, represents the Roman Empire. The power succeeding the Roman Empire, which received from the dragon his power and his seat and great authority, is clearly Papal Rome. So the Adventist Commentary points that out. Historian A.C. Flick explains that out of the ruins of political Rome arose the great moral empire in the giant form of the Roman Church. So whoever this beast power is, he gets its authority from pagan Rome. And we've seen in Revelation 13 that Papal Rome did. It received its power, its seat, and great authority from pagan Rome. We also see here that it says in verse 3 that all the world wandered after the beast. So this becomes not some small little religious organization in a corner, but it, this power gets its power from pagan Rome. That's identification point one. Uh, Papal Rome did. Secondly, this power is a worldwide universal power, or the word Catholic, of course, means universal and worldwide. Let me assure you, though, that God is not condemning an individual. No individual is the beast. God is pointing out the flaws in a system. God is warning us against a system, not only the papal system, but all systems which embrace its teachings and apostate religion that has drifted from the word of God. Another identifying mark of this power says in Revelation 13, verse 4 and 5, they worshiped the dragon who gave power to the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with him? He was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. Great things and blasphemies. When somebody says blasphemy, that can't be a religious power because blasphemy denies the power of God. It denies God exists. Not necessarily. Maybe some blasphemy does. But in the Bible, blasphemy is quite different. You remember Jesus was claimed to be a blasphemer. And we read in Luke chapter 5 that uh, the Pharisees said regarding Christ, this man blasphemes because as a man he makes himself God. So any human being that exalts to the place of God um, on earth uh, is, commits blasphemy. Then when Jesus claimed to forgive sin, and when he forgave sin, you look at another passage, John 10, verse 33, it says that, um, the, again, the Pharisees condemn Christ, and they say regarding Jesus, who can forgive sins but God alone? Now, did he, this man commits blasphemy. Did Jesus commit blasphemy when he claimed to be God? Not at all. When he said, I am the I am, he is the one who's existed from all eternity never had a beginning, never have an ending. Did Jesus commit blasphemy when he said he could forgive sin? Not at all. Why not? Because he could forgive sin because he was God. And so the Bible is very clear that uh, the forgiveness of sin is a prospect only of divinity. Has the papal power claimed that it has the ability to forgive sin? Certainly. The priests and their confessionals uh, claim every week that they are forgiving sin. What about this claim of the papal power to be exalted to the position of God? Here's an interesting statement by um, Pope Leo XIII. He boasted in great encyclical letters of Pope Leo XIII, page 193, we, the popes, hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. So the lesson this week points out that it's only the faith of Jesus that's going to take us through the crisis ahead, and that there will be a union of church and state, Protestant America, and the Roman Catholic powers, along with Protestant powers, along with other religious organizations at a time of great crisis will unite. And we'll find a union of religious, political, and economic powers. How are we going to get through that time? Only through Jesus. Only through his power. Only through his strength. And that power is available to you. If you're teaching the lesson, appeal to your class. 
to reach out to Jesus, to trust him. We need not fear the days ahead because Jesus is our Lord, Jesus is our Savior, Jesus is our High Priest, and Jesus is our coming King. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for Jesus who has made provision to get us through the crisis ahead. O oh Lord, speak to our hearts. O oh Lord, strengthen us. O oh Lord, draw us close to you. Help us to be faithful to you, not in our strength, but in yours. Keep us from drinking the wine of Babylon and help us continue feasting on your word in Christ's name. Amen.